Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Tom Parker Bowles and Daisy Lewis. <sighs> Good afternoon. Um, this is the post-lunch slot <laughs> when we'll be talking about food. Um, and uh, yeah, this is my fellow Brit. Tom Parker Bowles, um, who I actually spent lunch with, which was very nice. Very nice lunch. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about comfort food or British food, which probably I think for most people would, um, would cause consternation. Those two words together <laughs> are not natural bedfellows. <laughs> we have a terrible reputation. We do have a bad reputation, but as people who've been to London recently and, you know, in the past, as we were saying yesterday, British food is, has this awful reputation across the world as being dull and, 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 and industrial and dreary and gritty and lots of Gross, stodge and rubbish, yeah. um, which was true of a lot of the cases. But, you know, British food is, is about very, very good seasonal ingredients treated with, with you know, utter respect. So... As we say, the oysters or, or the asparagus or the gulls eggs or the strawberries or tomatoes or yeah. whatever it is, you know, salmon, salmon trout, sea trout, all these things don't travel very well. You know, you yeah. have to eat them at the very peak of their freshness. So British food at its heart is a very simple food, but it's just, you know, why aren't there British restaurants across the world? And saying this to Americans, I realise everyone would just laugh. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, done well. It, it, it can be good British food. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> I think so. I mean, I'm, I think... In terms of what I'm interested in is more the emotional attachment that we have to food. Yeah. And um, I'm going to ask you to go back in the, through the mists of time to your school days Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at Eton College, um, after which there's named a pudding, I believe. Yeah, eat a mess. I think eat and mess. Yeah. Does everyone here know what an eat and mess pudding is? Meringue and strawberries. And I don't think we ever eat it, ate it there at all. And God knows why it was named after eating. Yeah. The mess bit might be. But what was, be your, what was your, what was, what was, because I went, I went, I was lucky slash unlucky enough to go to an English boarding school as well. Um, and <laughs> and I, I feel like when I think of British food, I... I think, or English food, I, there's, there's something about the nursery. Mm. You know, it's nursery food, it's baby food, it's, you know, it, but it's also the food of, you know, imperialists who like kind of, well, well, <laughs> well <laughs> sort of, Tom, you know, sort of. But, you know, it, there is something about it which is quite, again, comforting. It's that child sort of... It is, and, and we, we go back to comfort food, and you think comfort food, whether you're British or American or, or Chinese or, or, or Indian, comfort food is going back to the food you were brought up on, the food of your youth, the, yeah. the food that brings back memories of unhappy memories or happy memories, and you're talking about British public school. Um, the British have a tradition of sending their boys, especially when they're seven, off to these rather austere, um, grim prep schools. Um, and I'm not going to go what into. What did they? No, go on. What did no, they? No, no, no. What did say. they feed you at school? What did I mean, they this feed was because e Ethan was fine. We'll go on to that later. But when you're seven or eight, yeah. and having had, as I was explaining yesterday, a very happy upbringing. You, grow, you know, growing up on a farm in the country, my father shot and fished, so we'd have all the sort of game and fish and all the rest of it. My mother was a good cook. Um, we ate sim roast chicken, roast yeah, beef, roast, you know, roast. And, you know, salads, but everything came from the garden in season. We had a real idea of what seasonality was. It wasn't a buzzword. It wasn't an opportunity yeah. to, you know, to whack a huge margin on top and say, hey, it's seasonal. Mm. This was sort of how we ate, you know. And it was, obviously, we'd have, you know, apples maybe in, 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 in January, February. But on the whole, we ate well and happily. And food was something we all sat together as a family. You slightly had to protect from my father if you're having sort of pork chops <laughs> or something because he would nick too. it. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So you, you <laughs> fought and you would eat quickly and we'd all talk and, and yeah. we'd all... And it was happy sitting around the Arga and, and, and sitting on the table. It was very yeah. happy. Then age eight, much to my mother's horror, my father sort of said, you know, you have to go to prep school. That's Does everyone here know what an Arga is? 
It's okay. a range. This it's is a basic key. Yeah, key to British. It's cooking. a very English thing. It's a, you know what ranges are when you have the you have the sort of a big range and you have four or two doors, and one's a hot oven and one's a warming oven. On the top you have two hot plates. Uh, one of which is hot and one which is really hot. So you have absolutely no control whatsoever. It's a nightmare to cook on because... No temperature gauges or anything, really. It's but, kind of... But people sit on it, the dogs get dry on it. You know, the dogs sit against it, you the sit dogs on get it. Dry you dry on clothes it. on it, you dry children on it. Um, <laughs> it. It is the heart. It's like the hearth. It's the and, heart and it of a home. And it heats the room. You know, in, in our kitchen at home, which is in the countryside, uh, it literally sits in, in the sort of middle of the room and, and crumpets will be toasted on it and, you know... Toast made on it. And yeah, everything. And there was a whole saga. There's a brilliant writer in England called Jilly Cooper who wrote things like Riders and Rivals, and they were called Arga Sagas. Or was that... Was that no, Mary that's Wesley? it. Was Arga that Sagas. It? Anyway, Argas are very much a part of rural English life and, you know, everything was around it. And it was, you know, it was a really... It was, the heart, it was a heart, yeah. thing, wasn't it? But you're sent off to this school, very, I'm sure, very expensive school, um, all boys... And this is where England got its bad reputation for food. This, yeah. As we were saying, you'd have breakfast where uh, the, the eggs were covered in grease, rock hard like hockey, pu hockey pucks, so cheap that they tasted of fish. Uh, <laughs> the bacon was great scummy slabs, spitting up, yeah. scummy slabs of disgusting pig yeah. with, with scum on it and over-salted and lots of fat and really, really repellent. Think Dickens, think Oliver. You it know? wasn't quite that. And this, <laughs> this was, we were born privileged. This, yeah. this, was, this was supposed to be part of... In English boys' education, the privilege of, of going to an all-boys school with some often questionable teachers. Um, but anyway, we won't go into that. <laughs> I get into awful trouble when I talk about that. But um, <laughs> nothing happened. Uh, but we'll get on to sausages <laughs> later. <laughs> uh, nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> But yes, and the sausages were, there's a great uh, food critic called Jonathan Meads who wrote for the Times and he described the British sausage the cheap, as slurry filled condoms, which they really were. It was all the bits you don't want to know about that were put into, <laughs> into these things. But what, what really what it was, was there was mince and the vegetables were overcooked and everything that British food, um, every cliche in British food was all there because it was yeah. this institutional food cooked without love or, and I was appalled. I was, uh, I was appalled. I can imagine <laughs> you, tiny, just being like, I'm not eating this It was much. disgusting. I'd <laughs> rather, I was all, you know, as I said, I was always hungry, not, not yeah. real hunger. I didn't know real hunger. I was a sort of child of privilege, but th this was, it was really, really bad food. And the, the best thing was on Sundays, we had crisps, yeah. um, chips, uh, cri yeah, chips they're called here, aren't they? Potato crisps, and and you'd have them in a sandwich like a chip butty. Yeah. Um, and this is a, this is a white bread. This is a British. This is a sort of again a part of the comfort food thing where you have two slabs of very thick white bread, and in the middle you put crisps. Very very good. And this nutritious was nutritious and delicious. It was the high point, genuinely, and margarine and and all that sort of stuff. And it was a high point, but the food was so bad, and this was everything that was bad about Britain. So it turned a healthy appetite into a, into an all encompassing greed. Because you took it for granted that food was, was good and, and, and food was civilised and, and this prep school was just really, really bad. And yep. if, you can th if you can thank it for anything, it was the fact that, you know, it, it, it got me into food a lot more than I would have been. Yeah. And, and But then you went on to, after that hell that was done there, then Eton was, was different because yeah. you sat in your own houses. And my housemaster, there was 40 boys in the house, there were probably... 10, 20 houses, I can't remember what. Some of them ate centrally in a dining hall, and some houses, like mine, ate. You had a chef, and my housemaster was a real food lover, so we had really good food. And, and also, we had a tuck shop. A uh, tuck shop was a sweet shop, because it was boarding school. So you'd go in there and spend your 10p. This was the 80s, uh, 20p, you know. Tom was, Tom was actually, uh, he looks quite young, but he was actually born in the Victorian era, <laughs> which is why this... <laughs> England was the Victorian era in that time. But, but it, it, it was, this tuck shop was amazing. You get bacon rolls and sausage rolls and crisps and yeah. all the candy you liked. And this was, I spent a lot of time in Roland's, it was called, the Eaton Tuck it's Shop. It's almost like the sort of, because the food is, I don't think it's necessarily about the school. Or it's just when you're making huge quantities, if you go to any institution, when you're making large quantities under pressure and under resource, it's not going to be great. It's not specific. <laughs> British. Well, I, I yeah, but I, I remember seeing at that time, at that time, back in, yeah. the, in the Victorian era when it was you not, were it was the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1984 or something, yeah. uh, not that long ago. But actually, this is the beginning of the 90s. But the, the food, this again, it was this institutional food, and it was you, you'd go to, you know, I seen French schools and Italian schools where they would do it properly. There was a yeah. real understanding in French, France, or Italy. Uh, I've seen it in China, India, Mexico, all over the world. Places that have a strong food culture. 
it's taken for granted that you'll take food with you to school or you'll sit around and eat at home. And, yeah. you know, the food culture is strong enough that it's not just arguing between each region, say, of France, you know, which is better, but village and house to house. My recipe is the best. This is the best. Yeah. There's this constant uh, competitive edge that keeps this tradition alive. And in Britain, you didn't really have that because from the Victorians who thought it was bad to talk about emotions and and talk about sensual things and talk about how much you loved it. You're supposed to keep it all in and not, you know, the sensual was seen yeah. as something bad. And, and yeah. therefore, the enjoyment of food was seen as somehow immoral, unchristian. Dirty. Um, dirty. And, yeah. and that's, again, this, this guilt that, that, that we, we inherited, I suppose, in Britain. Um, Presbyterian, um, you know, live to eat. Rather yeah. Than but on, the, eat flip live, on yeah. the flip side of that, what it does do is it means that food then becomes fetishized. Yeah. It, it, it also, you know, if you restrict or if you, if you make something sort of bad or uh, like it, then on the other side of it, it makes us crave it even more, as you said, this sort of greed. It, and it, it was, and again, going through the public school system, which is a private school system, as you call it here, but you were in with a whole lot of other boys and you'd obviously go off, once you found the joys of alcohol and, and everything else, um, you know, food sort of slightly paled and it's insignificant. So by the time I got to university, I don't think I ate at all. <laughs> 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 it was beer and, 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 and maybe <laughs> French fries and curry sauce, <laughs> fish and chips and sandwiches, but it wasn't a great, you know, you'd have thought at university, the job I do, oh, I sat and cooked dinner parties with larks, tongues and, and, and sort of... Uh, you know, things in One aspect. of my favourite things is a 12 bird roast. What, when you stuff, you start with the little, little uh, hummingbird. No, what is it? You start with the autolon, then it goes into the snipe, and it goes into the. You literally woodcock, start with a tiny bird, which you stuff into a slightly bigger bird, which you then stuff into it's a like slightly the bigger bird. Like the turkin, the or the turkey duck. But, but there, you know, again, once. Uh, I grew up at a time when the British food was getting. It, it threw off some of the cliches, and suddenly you'd have. You know, I don't know. I mean, the Gordon Ramsay's and the Rue Brothers in the market, they were all cooking French food. French food for many years in Britain was the posh food of England. You know, the, the state banquet menus are still in French. French yeah. food, when the revolution happened, a lot of the chefs came over when a lot of the aristocrats had their head lopped off. They came over to England and cooked for, for the, you know, the big dukes and the big, um, you know, for you had Carême and you had uh, um, Escoffier, yeah. or crook that he was. Um, and all these people, Cesar Ritz, I suppose, a hotelier, but they all came over. And French food was seen as... This was what the grand <laughs> aspirational, people, aspirational. Yeah. and British food was seen as somehow a bit de classe, a bit sort of, well you know. You know, it, 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 even now we still have it, sort of luxury, like perfume comes from parfum, which is French. Yeah. So anything which was sort of slightly highbrow, we sort of had a bit of an insecurity uh, complex. But of course, we beat the French in every war. That was the point. Uh, did we? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, I mean, there was that, that's why the French don't like us because we always <laughs> used to beat them in every war. Because we're just better. Aren't well, we? obviously, well, we. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I wouldn't say maybe, but but you know we have this love hate relationship with the French. We you know they more more um well, yeah more love than hate I suppose. Yeah, I think so. I think. But I their think food so. their food was very yeah. important in the UK, and by the time the seventies and eighties, you know you would never dare in the seventies or eighties go outside of London to eat in a hotel restaurant. You would get sort of tin soup, and and and, and in the middle you get well, a glass of the war, tomato juice. The war, that, that sort of attitude sort of carried over of things which we could preserve, you know, things which came in tins and, and things that were dried goods, really. But we had, I mean, what happened, there was a whole, from the Enclosures Act, which, which basically enclosed all the farmland over England, all the way through to, to women leaving the kitchen and going to work, to the world wars and rationing, to the white heat of technology where canning and preserving was seen as, as something <coughs> amazing and, and dehydrated. We lost our food culture. Britain lost its food culture. It lost its, its love of food, its interest in food. Um, and it only really started coming back, ironically, in the 80s and 90s when it was Italian food or, or French food sure. again, Mexican, Chinese. But British food itself you know, it still has a big problem with how it's seen across the world. Now, if you go to London, you go to Wilton's, you go to St. John, um, St. John, which is Fergus Henderson, knows to ten. Yeah, it's so very Wilton's, much I mean, tell us a little bit about, when you think of a quintessentially English restaurant, which restaurant would you... I'd say, I mean, if you want to do... I mean, there's, there's Going back to that idea of nursery food, the upper classes love nursery food. It was a food that their nanny cooked them. You know, bangers and mash. What was your nanny pie. called again? My nanny's called Rara. Mary was her name, but she's called Rara. Uh, she looks after my children now sometimes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was this very much this thing of 
uh, stodgy, non-threatening. You know, it could be yeah. very, very good food. Um, steak and kidney pudding. No, nothing particularly light. Nothing particularly uh, Hearty. elegant. Hearty for cold winters and wet, grey days. You yeah. know, it's sort of ballast After and, and you've filling. After you done Shoot, outdoor pursuits. Shooting or hunting or whatever the hell yeah. you're doing. Um, but so there's a tradition in London of gentlemen's clubs that are still there. Men-only clubs, whites, boodles, bucks, all these ones in St. James's, which are very, they've been going for 300 years. You wear a suit still, it's all men, and you very much get potted shrimp, smoked salmon, smoked eel, steak kidney pudding, lamb cutlets, uh, you know, veal kidneys, uh, this sort of quite manly, quite upper class sort of food. You'd have that. Then you'd have the hotel food, you know, the Ritz, the Savoy, doing French, French food, sort of food. Yeah. Then you'd have the pub, which would be a pickled egg and, and a pint. Um, and in between it, there wasn't really much. There were Lion's Corner Houses, which were sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, which you could get uh, a uh, decent Today, if, if, if somebody from our audience wanted to go to a quintessentially English restaurant. Well, this, bi this being Palm Springs, like Wilton's would be the place I think you go to because it's, we've talked about Wilton's, it's, it, you, it still has the way... Describe waitress Wilton. Wilson's is like a sort of Edwardian railway carriage. Um, <laughs> the carpet is, is thick like that. You sink into the carpet. There are booths. There are always cabinet ministers there, usually conservative cabinet ministers. Um, you can get fish, Dover sole, turbot. You get oysters, six different kinds of oysters. You get potted shrimps. You get cold consomme, jellied consomme, which is delicious, sort of savoury. Jellied. Savoury, savoury jellies. jellies. They love that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you were to have one... Your quintessentially English meal at your quintessentially English restaurant. If you were to go into Wilton's Wil and it was <laughs> going to be your last meal at Wilton's, what would you order? Well, there's a great, there's there's a tiny, tiny window in in Britain in in, in the season, which is around about April. Gulls eggs. Now, seagulls, you think, noisy buggers. All they do is squawk and, and make a hell of a noise. But the black-headed gull is a particularly clever bird. And once a year, for about three weeks, it's the gulls egg season. Now, they cost about... Fifteen dollars each. They're about that big, beautiful speckled uh, green with with chocolate speckles on them, and they're collected. They're very regulated how they're collected um, for for conservation reasons. But they are the best eggs you could ever eat, and they made it all the sweeter because they only come in season for this tiny, tiny period. And would that be a starter? That would be a starter. So six of those for a starter. Boiled. Then boiled, just so soft boiled. So it's the soft boiled. Would you have toast with it? No, no, no. You eat them just with celery salt. That's the nice. first. So that's the with a spoon. No, nope, just. Peel them and chuck them in your mouth. Nice. Yeah, very okay. nice. Very, very what basic. What would you drink with that? Well, that probably wouldn't be English. <laughs> probably <laughs> French, I guess. <laughs> but but uh, let, let's, let's move on swiftly from that. Oh, maybe <laughs> sort of shabby or something. And then move on to, a, I don't know, an 82 claret of some kind. But let's, let's keep on the English side. Um, then oysters. We do the whole point of, of Britain. It's always raining in Britain. And the good thing about rain in Britain means there's lots of grass. And lots of grass means lots of delicious milk and butter and grass-fed animals. So we have a very strong tradition of grass-fed beef or um, mutton, all, all the animals, good stuff. And then amazing cheeses. We've now got, we've, we've we're starting to beat the French at cheeses, yeah. which annoys the hell out of them. So, but so there we go. going back <laughs> to our menu, we've had our gulls eggs. Oysters, a dozen Colchester oysters. They're natives. Now, the rocks are the ones which are bigger, like that. They're slightly, they're, they're less subtle. You get them all over the world. The natives are natives of the UK. Very thin, very delicate, very subtle. Slight, sort of, they taste of sort of sea air. Um, they're just really, really good. With a tiny drop of Tabasco, so bringing in the American okay, connection. Okay, so you're you know. not, you're not uh, a vinegar man. No, I go to t one drop of Tabasco, maybe green Got Tabasco. It. Then Dover Sole, probably. Nice. Now, Dover Sole is, I'm sure you can get Dover Sole here. Can you? Yeah, yeah. It's a, but it's a fantastic fish. Dover Sole. And these are just little what starters. What would you have on the side? These are starters. Yeah, chips, maybe. I don't know. Chips. Uh, would you don't sell nice. Chips, mashed potato. And then these are just, and then you go on to meat. And after okay, that. this is a key question. What type of chips do you like? Oh, French fries. French, French fries. fries. Yeah. Okay, okay. But we're go we were talking about this yesterday. The, the quintessential British dish is fish and chips. So you get all these slightly um, nationalistic people saying, Fish and chips, yeah, this is, you know, we're British, this is fish and chips, this is the most British thing you could ever eat. And of course, fried fish came in with Jewish immigrants round about the 17th, 18th century. It was sold cold on the streets, so that was a Jewish Ashkenazi drink, um, dish. And chips were French, so you get these, these British people proclaiming how British, you know, this is British, oh, yeah. and waving the flag, and it's a Jewish-French hybrid, which w is always funny. But as an <laughs> island nation, sort of over the centuries, our kind of, our population, we've, 
we've been sort of washed over by invasions. So we have the Vikings, and we have the Celts, well, we, and then we have... We had lots of... The, you know, it was... We were never actually conquered, weirdly. We've had tons. We've had Normans, obviously. Sure, but Celts, it... Celts, yeah. And it all... The Romans brought huge amounts of things, herbs and, 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 and you know, different ways of cooking. So we, we have had, like, all food and all history. You can see the history of the country through the food on the plate. You can see the invasions that come through. Look at Sicily with the Moors coming in and that sort of agro dolce, the sweet sour. Yeah. And you can see that in, on, on the streets of Thailand with the more Chinese. You know, you see food, you see history through food. And yeah. this is going back to the bigger idea. Yes, we all love eating food and food's wonderful, but food isn't just a hobby. Food is, 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 is so much more than that. You know, it, it's health, it's wealth, it's happiness. It's connected to civilization. It's, it's, it's very emotional. Very it's emotional, Memories yeah. as well. So and, yeah. We're going to get back to your Wilton's mix. I'm, I'm going to take notes on this. So <laughs> we've had the girls' eggs. We've had the oysters. We've now had a Dover sole with chips, French yeah. fries. Maybe a what, steak. Maybe what? Okay. So You're asking for my last meal, so I'm, I, will okay. have, I will have a limitless appetite, and, okay, and I won't care about. So great. just to go through. Quite protein heavy, though, which is nice. Yeah. yeah, I don't even know the difference between all those things. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> but but steak, you know, but grass fed. I love coming to America and eating um, the corn fed stuff. It's tender, it's sweet, it's but it's very different from from the British, which is more chewy. How do you ha how do you have your steak cooked? Blue, blue, blue. cold in the middle. Yeah, interesting, <laughs> interesting. Because my mum's very funny about that as well. well. Overcooked. Yeah, if it's overcooked, if meat is overcooked, she's quite a snob about it. If 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 meat is overcooked she it's she sees it as a sort of middle class thing oh i God. think <laughs> yeah no my mum's a snob a raging <laughs> snob but there's something about it that and and she errs towards the french side of blue yeah i yeah i didn't even see that as a class thing but as always in england there's always a class angle somewhere isn't there yeah well there we go <laughs> yeah well We've now established that my mother's a snob. She'll be very <laughs> pleased that I have said this out loud in <laughs> America. <laughs> but it, it does go back to that thing of, of very of English food being very, very, you know, in basic. You know, it, it's a good ingredient with very little done to it. For me, that's what good food is about. Um, although, you know, different cultures and different cuisines, I love traveling, you know, I love, yeah. and, uh, and to get out to go to Mexico or Thailand or come across America or anywhere, that for me is to see how other people eat. You know, you see, you have a window into society, how other people live, through how they eat mm. and, and what they eat. And, yeah. and it's, it's a constant giveaway. You know, it's that thing that Brillat Savlin no, said. absolutely. You know, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. You know, which has changed into you are what you eat, which is a, a sort of bastardization of it. But you can tell so much by looking. Do you ever, when you go to the supermarket and look at people's shopping trolleys, fascinating. Yeah. You learn so much about people. But again, it's, it's uh, as you said, like everything in England is, is comes down to class. At some point, it comes into play with it. Mm. It really does. And and it's it it becomes in the seventies especially, you know things like um, pineapple and cheese on sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the cocktail food. It yeah, but it was very sophisticated in some circles. It no, was seen as sophisticated, <laughs> but actually now would be looked down on in certain households. My mother's probably. <laughs> I'm petrified your mother. I, mean, I know. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But but I again, going back to that thing of food being, you know, food is is. It, it, you can see so much through, through, through food, and um, more and more research is being done in the behavioral things of food and feeding. You know, this is the thing I was talking about yesterday. People come out of a triple bypass operation in, in an NHS hospital, and they're fed some awful deep fry thing. There's no link up between food and health, which sure. seems absolutely crazy. You know, yeah. children going mad. My children, when they have Sugar, sugar, they go mad. I mean, we all love sugar, and I refuse to believe that sugar or fat or whatever it is is the enemy. You know, a yeah. balanced diet and, yeah. and the danger of making food good or bad, of yeah. making it dirty or clean. This is why eating disorders are on the rise in type 2 diabetes and obesity. It's this stigmatization of food. And we, you know, to have a healthy, balanced, balanced. holistic yeah. view of food is very, very important. So and going back to your balanced. Um, your balanced meal at Wilton's. Right, we've had we're back to Wilson's <laughs> again, yeah. <laughs> we've had the gulls eggs. Yeah. We've had the oysters. Potted shrimps as well. Potted shrimps as well. Definitely, now, does everyone yeah. know what potted shrimps are? Tiny little, the only, we call shrimps prawns in the UK, but shrimps, these tiny little brown shrimp, full of flavour, and they're potted, which is a very English way of preserving. So it's kept in clarified butter, spice, mace, cane pepper. So in the days before refrigeration, you have potted beef, potted ham, and it could keep. 
you know, in the days before refrigeration, of course, pickling, potting were very, very important techniques of preservation. So potted shrimps on brown toast, on toast, so it melts. That's another. God, these, yeah, these, yeah so there's, uh, there's quite a lot I'm going to eat on this last meal, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm <laughs> actually getting hungry just thinking about it, and I've already had, I've just had lunch. So we've now gone into the steak. We've we, we've done the, done the steak, and then we're going to move on to the savoury, which is a uniquely English ah, thing that we're talking about. Ah, the savoury. Which, which again, the French understand it is it's a sort of it's a sort of intermission. So before you have dessert, there's another course of British event called the savoury, which is something like. Welsh rabbit, which is cheese on toast, or Scotch woodcock, which is scrambled eggs on toast with anchovies. It's usually it salty. It seems to have a lot of eggs in it. It's salty. It's pungent. Cheese. It's a bit of sometimes cheese. It's just another little course in case I don't can't get excited about dessert too much. So I like this this extra course in the middle, which is very very English and very sort of gentleman's club and hotel sort of English. Yeah, is the savoury and it's a whole art. There's a book by a guy called Ambrose Heath called The Art of the Savoury. Yeah, three hundred different recipes. Fantastic. I think it's probably like that thing where people ask you, are you a chocolate or a cheese person? You kind of go for one or the other. I, I prefer the savoury side of things. But then we move into puddings. Now, puddings yes. is like, along with roast, is what Tell all British... Tell us about pudding. your spotted dick. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> See, innuendo never goes away in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting <laughs> to say uh, <laughs> we have a tradition of suet puddings, of heavy, wintry puddings. Spotted dick, which is particularly, I, don't, I can't get excited. It was it suet with raisins in, oh. custard. Um, suet. Does everyone know what suet is? Yeah, it's the yeah. fat around kidneys. Um, it, so and it's very good for making this sort of suet thing. But treacle tart, sticky toffee pudding, that's actually Canadian, although it sounds very English. Um, these heavy roly-polies, yeah. jam roly-polies. They they're not... They're not that fruit-based. I mean, you do get the crumble, but Apple main, crumble, yeah. when I think of British puddings, I generally tend to think of of cakey type things. There's no, not so much the meringue or or like in France, you know, parfaits or things like that. Oh no, they're just they're fairly sort of basic and uncomplicated, like your typical. Pudding. Yeah, yeah, and hot, <laughs> hot, and you know, we have a climate. We coming to Palm Springs, of course, it's pretty uh, civilized. You know, I, I was talking to the taxi driver. He said, "Yeah, you know, we really we get about an inch of rain a year." It's like, God, we I get know. We, we get that in an afternoon in London. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it, and you can see why it's so attractive here. Um, but this is food, this is fodder, this is, this is why there are problems. Because in the old days when people worked a lot more outside and, and it was a lot more manual and people were, were more active, this sort of food would, would keep you going all day. It would comfort you. Now it just... Warm, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not subtle food often. No. Um, <laughs> but it's good, yeah. It is. Now, do you think, is there a reason why there's, there's, there's an absence of spice, it, chili? We don't tend to have a lot of chili or well you see we, you think of the empire now we're not allowed to talk about the empire the empire when when the spice trade the spice trade you but know, even despite that it didn't creep into our kind of mainstay it did in tudor times and going through that there was a lot of spice it was a show you know if you had lots of black pepper for example mace whatever it was a, a show, show of, of how rich you are and, yeah. and tudor food was all about showing how rich you are. there's a lot of sweet and savory food and it was all about showing off like the romans you know showing off how rich you are how much spice you had um, and you think about things like mince pies. Which, do we have mince pies at Christmas? Um, I, I mean, the British Christmas feast, I don't think you start on that. It's the most depressing feast. Tur Overdry turkey, heavy, stodgy but Christmas. But the turkey we, we, you know, we stole pretty much. I mean, it, Queen, this Queen Victoria comes from America. Obviously, it's yeah. native to America, the turkey. And Queen Victoria and Prince Albert sort of invented Christmas in the UK as we know it. Christmas yeah, was more Dickensian of a pagan. Yeah, the Dickensian idea of Christmas. Yeah, and it wasn't, it wasn't, we, we ate boar's heads and beef and, and, and then suddenly turkey comes in, yeah. overcooked, a bit dry. Well, my, uh, my ancestors <laughs> are actually Danish, so we tend to have roast goose. Yeah, goose is great as well, but it, it is, I mean, let's move away from Christmas, it's too depressing, we've just gone over Christmas. We, yeah, we so have, yeah, we're, so we're out, we're out the other side. Uh, but we're yeah, all on but diets. But it, well, we're not, not, if you go into Palm Springs on a diet, you're not going to go, there's so many restaurants here, I mean. Where do we go? There? Oh, Mexican, some good Mexican food here. Sorry, I'm not even getting... I'm going <laughs> off... I love good Mexican food and, and, and good everything. But, but yeah, so where were we? Are we on... We were talking Wilters. about... we finished now. now we I'm, I'm finished... Being, I'm being wheeled out on a gurney now. From, yeah, from you've my now... <laughs> you've <laughs> now... You're now about to have a triple hot... That, well, we've sort of gone through the heavy puddings, haven't we? Uh, what about yeah. the seasonal fruits? What about the crumble? 
Yeah, I mean, it's all the you same, don't really, isn't it? don't seem too keen on them. It's pudding dessert. It's, it's, you know, you're not a pudding lover. No, I can, I, on, on you could live without. Let's move, uh, move on. But, so, but yeah, but it's going back to this thing that try... I mean, has, is there, there are no British restaurants in Palm Springs? No, I forget <laughs> what it's called. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but no, it's interesting to, to think about spice and think about the influences of the empire on, on our cuisine. Because when you also think about British food, or when I think of a particularly comforting British food, I tend to think of a curry. Sunday nights, you have, well, I and a lot of friends of mine, you would have a pretty horrendous hangover from your Saturday night. Or if you go out on a Friday night, you know, especially when I was at university, we would have a curry. And, and, and I mean to comfort us. And curry is very, imp very interesting. Curry in the UK is not Indian. A Madras, a Vindaloo, no one in India have a clue what a Madras was or what a Vindaloo was or, a, or so much of a korma. What but would happen? We'd appropriate it. You would say it was a part of our British... It is. It's, it's British. British food. It is British food. What would happen is a huge wave of Indian and Pakistani... Oh, I wasn't Pakistani actually then because Pakistan wasn't quite... Let's say Indian and, and Bangladeshi immigration came through the 30s, 40s, 50s and brought their food with them. But the British like things quite sweet, quite mild. Uh, so they adapted, adapted these curries for the British palate and they became the curry house curries, the stuff, you know, cheap, cheerful. And if you want Madras, quite hot, Vindaloo, really hot. Now the classic Vindaloo is obviously a, a goan dish, which is with a Vindaloo, which is, you know, uh, vinegar and garlic. It was a Portuguese dish that was with um, maybe pork in, in Goa. But Vindaloo just means five teaspoons of the hottest chili powder in the world and just blows your head off and it's what people are... Are you a fan of curries? I like curries. We all, most people in Britain like curries. You know, when would you have a curry? What would be the scenario that you would have just a curry? Just sometimes you crave a curry. You would you have it at lunch? No, because you sleep for about two days afterwards. Exactly. No, it's it quite, would quite it heavy. Be, would it be after, like... A boy's night out. It's probably after a few pints you do. You know, yeah. this is a very British thing. Everyone goes out and gets wasted um, <laughs> on cheap fizzy beer, you know, five, ten pints, and then you end with a curry. Um, and that is seen as a, and a fight. Not that we would have a fight, <laughs> but that would be a very British night out. Ten pints, a fight, and a curry. Uh, and that would be seen as a huge success. <laughs> but obviously, I wouldn't do that. because No, be no, no, obviously not. But it is, it is something that is part of British culture. Um, Still happens a lot in all over the country. Yeah. Um, you know, ten pints of really, really fizzy thing, and then yeah, the hottest <laughs> curry you could possibly imagine, and then <laughs> oh my god, stumble home. But this is this is what universities and 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 uh, yeah, it still happens. But it is very much part of tradition, and therefore, yeah. when you think of a curry, the, the, the chicken tikka masala was based on the on the Delhi butter chicken. Do you chicken. guys have? Do you, is is curry a, a sort of cultural phenomenon here? Would you have a curry? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it would be, but it, it's more to go and have something more civil. It's not Friday night part of the, no, the ritual to go out and get, no. get bladdered and so go and have a curry. What no. would the equivalent <laughs> be? What would be the kind of naughty kind of we've gone out or like if you're a college student, would it... Greasy, so sort of. Oh, we haven't. Oh, we haven't started. Now you brought us to hamburgers. That, well, that, that's obviously something that's taken over the world, and thank God for that. But just moving across from greasy, we're talking about there. The next day after that curry and the pint, you would go for breakfast. The full English <laughs> breakfast, <laughs> which is greasy, which is, and that would be with you'd have sweet tea, um, bacon, bacon, eggs, baked beans. But it would, you know, again, not very British, but they would they would be there. Black pudding. Uh, my dad talks do you know about what breakfast. Do you have black pudding here? It's blood pudding with oats. So blood and oats and seasoning. <laughs> <laughs> <People like laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> yeah, literally deep, you deep do pig fried. Blood. Pig blood uh, with, with <laughs> I can see everyone appalled. With. Uh, you have white pudding, which, is, which doesn't have blood in it. And you have, but the French have a big tradition of these blood Boudin puddings. Boudin noir is the name in French, yeah. And it's a different style sausage. But again, breakfast is the other thing that someone said, I think it was, um, who was it? Somerset Maughan said that you can eat very well in Britain if you eat breakfast three times a day. Now that's changed a bit, but that was the common thing, that yeah. it was this great breakfast and, and people from around the world would just come and laugh at British food, you know, because yeah. it was this dodgy. But but done, I think done, you know, done well. I mean, do you, so there's a, there's a sort of contention. Here, bacon tends to be back bacon. Would you have back bacon or do you have the streaky bacon? Streaky. 
very thin streak here. Yeah, you, I love that Oscar Mayer side. I'm not I'm supposed to. You know, the, the Oscar Mayer thin bacon is fantastic. I'm sure it's not too too happy pigs, but I think. What yeah. type? Because some. It's streaky, it's a streaky, divide, well cooked streaky. Right, you yeah, see, it's well a dividing thing because some people like the back bacon with yeah. more of the soft, sort of slightly pinker. Do you go for very crispy bacon? Very crispy bacon, yeah. I mean, that's that's uh, having spent a lot of time in, in, in America. Yeah. You learn pretty sharpish that bacon's well done and eggs are done in a certain way. And yeah, th I almost prefer an American breakfast to an English would you breakfast. Yeah, would you say a fried egg was English and scrambled eggs or oeuf brûlé is more French? No, I don't. I think, you know, wh wherever there's an egg, you do whatever you want to it and you'd call it whatever you Fair want enough. to it. It would be huevos revoltos or it would be... Yeah. It would be uh, masala eggs, sure. whatever culture has an egg, they're going to scramble it, they're going to fry it, they're going to poach it, and they will claim it as their own. That is your classic culinary nationalism. This is our dish. And actually, you look at versions all across the world that are exactly the same. That mushrooms and tomatoes. <laughs> I'm sure you, you, you have mushrooms and tomatoes in America, but don't you? But in your, full in your version of the full English, what a... You know, you've got you've got the big boys, you've got the eggs and the bacon, which are kind of non-negotiable. But then, would you go for the mushrooms and the tomatoes as well? Uh, you know, I uh, if it was there, I'd have it. If I didn't, I not that interested. Not in that. Nah. I, it would it would fly over my head that one. Uh, yeah, I'd have uh, mushrooms maybe. Fried yeah. toast, deep fried. Oh yeah, deep fried toast. Yeah, fried bread. That's another great thing. Fried bread. <laughs> this is making you all very hungry as your hearts are furring up, uh, listening to, to <laughs> basically <laughs> a coronary on a plate. <laughs> but again, it's all about balance. You can go and eat lettuce and you can go and have your Dover sole and you can have your turbot or your yeah. bass. Um, and then you can have your sausages and your black pudding, whatever. I don't think anyone could survive on that sort of food alone. No, but, I, but also, you know, oats and porridge, you know. That's Scottish. Well, yeah. it's British still, yeah. you but know. Again, the Scottish don't tend to like the English very much. No. This is <laughs> very. This is Today very is Burns true. Night. Today is. It is, is Burns Night. Burns, and you all know what happens on Burns Night. Uh, the haggis comes out. The so Scottish. Explain what Burns Night is. Robbie Burns. Robbie Burns, the great national poet of Scotland. Um, Burns Night is is sort of the, the the national celebration of their great poet, and a haggis. And you know what a haggis is? It's it's sheep gut. Everything pushed into a gut, but it's 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 minced uh, sheep oats. lungs with oats with a bit of liver, with a bit of meat. It's all seasoned white pepper in there and then steamed. And it's brought out. I mean, yeah, I know. I can also you can, ugh. And it's sort of, I agree, it's, it's an acquired taste. But on Burns Night, you have neeps, which are sort of Swedes with butter mashed up. And the haggis is brought out ceremonial, ceremonially, usually to the sound of bagpipes. And there is uh, a poem recited, the great Robbie Burns poem, great chieftain of the um, pudding race. Um, obviously said in a very English accent, that not a Scottish one. And it's ceremonially piped around, and then the top is chopped off with a sword and done it. And they proceed to get blind drunk on whiskey and eat, and, and eat um, haggis. And that's going to happen tonight all over Scotland. There will be a lot of people drinking a lot of whiskey and eating haggis, <laughs> as there will be across the world. But, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very different Scottish food. From English Just food. sitting here talking, it, it does strike me that, uh, again, a lot of this food is sort of heavy and I associate the comfort foods with winter foods but what would you say was a British summer menu um, would it change we're more suited to, to to winter I'll be honest with with British food maybe the beef uh there's still be roast uh a salad maybe no <laughs> it's fish summer food again there's in between the wars the great British English summer food was very much influenced by the great American hostesses who would come in, who would come in in between the wars, and they had their salons in London, and they were cooking French-inspired, very, you know, much more sort of... Lighter. Uh, lighter, and that was, again, very much the rich and, and, and the upper classes. But, you know, summer food, I'm trying to think of summer food. You just think of, I'm thinking of comfort food is not really summer food. Um, food in summer. <laughs> Strawberries, exactly. Strawberries are late summer. There we go. Ice cream, sorbets. These all these wonderful berries that come through. But I think of fish. Fish, chilled soups, more of a French thing, really, with the Vichy Soir and the. Uh, but again, we gazpacho, Spanish. Um, we're not good at light food. F apart, our chefs are. Mushy peas is certainly not light. <laughs> Marrow fat peas, you know, wrapped in fish and chips. We're going back to all these things. They're hearty. They're hearty dishes. They are hearty. And, and Britain's not, a, as you all well know, it's not a... It's not We're a not a warm climate, even no. summer. Summer can be warm. And we all... In Britain, it, it, you'd Picnics. be amazed. Though. Pic yeah. 
talk to us about sandwiches. <laughs> well, the early... You know what sandwiches where, are? Really? Where did... No, but, but the etymology of it as well, because there's, I, there's, I think of sandwiches as being a very British thing, a picnic basket, a hamper mm. with... Sure, there, cucumber there, there, sandwiches and there are sandwiches from every, every culture has a sandwich. There's a there's a uh, is it apocryphal the story apocryphal about the story. early the, there was a the story about the Earl of Sandwich who was a gambler and he was on a winning streak playing cards 200, 300 years ago, 250 years ago, and he said in get his beef and he didn't want to leave the table to go and eat it, so he told his servant go and get me you know, put it between two pieces of bread, and the sandwich is invented. Now that is an apocryphal. Am story. I wrong? Do you think do you do you not associate? Cucumber sandwiches. Yes, that's as a very particular. That's high tea, but that's the last sure, thing. Sure, but I still think of it in. She summer. was in this program called Downton Abbey. That I was don't big <laughs> in, in this. Is, I can now put it back on her. Downton Abbey was a program off. about about toffs, wasn't it? In yeah, in it was about an aristocratic family and their um, downstairs friends. It was upstairs downstairs, <laughs> like the thing. We of, won't yeah. say servants. They got it, he got it all wrong, Julian Fellows, about the real thing. But but she was brilliant. The acting was brilliant. <laughs> was yeah. it? Oh, is, is it come over here? Yeah. Yeah, the whole. Oh, okay. Well, that's it. So, therefore, that's. Oh, did you? Okay. Uh, God, I thought it was just. Was it big all over the world? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was that's a vision. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 12 million viewers, Tom. 12 million viewers, but, just saying. But that's a vision of Britain that is not necessarily. People see Britain just as, you know, because we know how, how five minutes go. It's a vision of Britain. People see it as. As the roasts, as the puddings, as the picnics, as high tea, you know, scones, not scones. What would you scones. say contemporary British food? Because it's, it's Thai, it's Indian, it's Mexican, it's Italian, it's partly British. Contemporary Britain, like contemporary British food, like contemporary Britain, is a mishmash of everything. You know, London being this great immigrant city, Britain, you know, taking all these different cultures, Caribbean cultures, uh, Indian, Sri Lankan cultures, all these ways of immigration that for me and for many others, made Britain great and interesting and multicultural. That is what modern Britain is now. So you just as much go out for Pad Thai or, or uh, I don't know, Penny Ado Rabiata, or whatever it would be, yeah. as you would for fish and chips or roast. The point is you we have choice now. We have this world now that is very cosmopolitan. Everyone travels. Travel is cheap. People bring back inspiration. Sure. You're just as likely now to find... I remember 20 years ago, you could find one chili in the supermarket, a fresh chili, a really a Dutch, no heat at all. Now there's habanero, jalapeno, serrano, chipotle. Yeah. This is in your average supermarket in the UK. Yeah. We are a sponge, the UK. We, 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 because we don't have a strong food culture. When you go to the supermarket, um, what do you tend to buy? Would you ever buy ready meals? No. 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 Look at, look at the face. No, I mean, disgusting, yeah. You can't. cook. It, cooking yeah. is cook, going back to that. Cooking. How often do you cook for yourself? Most of the time, because cooking is not just about cooking. Cooking relaxes you. Cooking. Uh, you, it's even the, the most basic of boiling an egg. If more people knew how to boil an egg, make a salad dressing, make What's a salad. What's your favourite dish to cook? Oh God, it depends on the day. The okay. Minute of the day. So if the you were to cook your wife a romantic dinner for two, what would you cook her? Big tin of caviar. <laughs> that's no, that's, that's not a good cooking. One. That's a not big cooking. tin of caviar. That's the most, most romantic food, and that's obviously not British at all. So, what else? It would be a Thai curry. It would be a Mexican dish. It would be maybe uh, tacos or pasta. I wouldn't be our pasta because I wouldn't have a spit. But um, it, it might be, uh, I don't know, some sort of Mexican dish, maybe Thai, maybe a, a lav, maybe a, a curry, you know, something like, or an Indian curry. That's what I'm saying is that, again, we would sometimes cook fish or something like that or roast chicken my mother's roast chicken we you know something that's the comfort food of my youth but nowadays the average brit wouldn't cook that much so-called british food they would cook food probably like you from all over the world and Absolutely. that and that and that is what modern british food is now again this sponge this this country that takes all the influences together and somehow makes it british and now i I've completely lost track. I've done a rubbish job. I've completely lost track of time. So we've got a couple of minutes, and I can see there's two people who are desperate to ask Tom some questions. Or Daisy. <laughs> and no, let's. <laughs> uh, in Jim Carner, um, fantastic. Jim Carner in 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 Albemarle Street, high end regional Indian food. Um, St John for for modern British food in the East End. Som Saf, a Thai, uh, Shik Yumen or Royal China Club for Cantonese. So, um, Bar Shoot, you, you know, I, I'm a restaurant critic, I can go on for 
hours on this one. Um, I will give them to you always, but it, depending what, what anything else you like. London's great for these sort of restaurants. Uh, Scots, Ooh, sorry. That's interesting. Um, I'm quite an emotional eater. I like going back to places where I've had uh, Scots. I very much, I've had some wonderful meals at Scots. And that's seafood. Yeah. Um, and actually there's, there's one cafe in the east end of London called the Shepherdess Cafe. That's um, uh, that, that I, there's the cover of a book I did about Scots. That's oh, a is classic, it? Classic, sort of it's, it's yeah. a that, if you want to have a classic English fry-up, I'd say go there, the Shepherdess Cafe. Oh, the Woolsey. The Woolsey's fantastic. For, for a London restaurant with a scene and it has that, that the, the food's good, but it's not out of this world, but it's, it's quintessentially London. Yeah, it is. Um, it absolutely is. And, and then I think, where else would there be? For high tea, I, I love... I love Fortnum and Mason, I would yeah. say that, wouldn't I? Fortnum and Mason for tea. <laughs> um, Welsh rabbit at Fortnum and Mason, definitely. I, I love... You know, tea is such a... I, it, remind, it makes me think of, of England. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, I'm entirely privileged. <laughs> we were talking about gristle yesterday, weren't we? I mean, I'll tell you what, a gristle, gristle brothers I love, but on the other hand, bones, bone marrow. That's a fantastic thing. A St. John, bone marrow, roasted, scooped out, salt on sourdough toast with parsley salad. Oof, fantastic. Yeah. Pure fat, pure delicious. Can't bear it. And on that note, we're going to say goodbye. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you. <laughs>